Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. We are here and exist to respond to the questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in church. I am here with uh, my illustrious, our illustrious co-host, Aaron Mercer. Good to see you. Good to see you, Peter. Our wonderful, flexible, uh, great producer, Nathan Yoder. And then today we have a special guest. His name is Derek Sherman. He is a professor at Calvin, not Calvin College, Calvin University, which many of our listeners uh, have heard of or even attended. And today the topic we're talking about is why does Jesus influence my engineering career? So I think this is a great question. Just before we even jump in, uh, there's a book, um, if you're watching it on video, uh, it's called A Christian Guide to Technology for Engineers and Designers. Derek is one of the authors. And if you type in why God, um, when you buy the book from Ivy Press, you get 30% off. So that is our quick little commercial. But Aaron, why does Jesus influence my engineering career? What do you think? I, 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 I like the question. I think it's going to be a fun conversation. Um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of engineers, certainly near where we live in Rochester. I've had lots of engineering friends. I'm, I'm not an engineer myself, um, but I do, I do uh, love to talk about technology and design. And uh, I think that there's, there's a lot to really uh, dig into here. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Derek, thanks so much for, for being on here with us. Um, yeah, thank you and, for inviting uh, me. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think this this is going to end up being a good call for us to a good podcast for us to share with a lot of our friends either around uh, where we live or for me. I went to I went also went to a Christian school. I went to Cedarville University. Is a lot of engineering friends from there too, and I think this will be a good um, a good one for a lot of our our friends for sure. I'm, but I'm curious, uh, Derek. Thanks so much again for being on this call and and for providing this uh, resource. I I loved um, starting to kind of look through it and look through the uh, comments that were in there, some of the the precursor remarks that were put in there uh, from other people as well as from yourself and just a lot of a lot of people saying, you know, I wish that this book was here when I was going through my engineering, uh, starting off as an engineer. Um, I'm, I'm curious, first of all, I'd love to know a little bit of your story. How did you get to Calvin in the first place? Um, and then what kind of inspired you to to write this book? You know, you're 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 working in a Christian educational environment, helping people integrate their faith in their their work. But like what what spurred this book? Um, so, yeah, we'd love a little more backstory. Sure. Yeah, no. And, and I should begin by saying I wish a book like this was out when I was a young engineer, too. Um, and uh, I suppose if I could teleport myself back or at least the book, um, I would certainly do that. Um, as well as many other resources. I, I, I grew up in a Christian home in Canada, so I'm Canadian, uh, near Toronto, and uh, was always fascinated by electronics. And uh, already at an early age, I was tinkering with electronic sort of hobbyist kind of um, projects. I, uh, I got into amateur ham radio. I got my ham radio license and uh, built some of my own equipment. And of course, it was also the time that uh, early PCs were beginning to make their way into people's homes. And this will date me somewhat, but I, you know, I, my first computer was a Timex Sinclair ZX81, which is a small uh, computer with about one kilobyte of memory and a membrane keyboard. And you hook it up to your television and an audio cassette to save programs. Um, so it was, it was very, um, it was, it was very modest by today's standards for sure, but it was magical and it sort of captured my imagination. And, uh, and so as a hobbyist, I, I, uh, I began to uh, uh, learn more and more about computing and about um, electronics. And, uh, and from uh, high school, I went on to study engineering at a large engineering school in, in Canada. I became an electrical engineer and began working in a high tech company. Um, designing hardware and software solutions for various, various industrial problems and, uh, and really enjoyed that work. Um, really delighted at being paid to do what was, you know, at that time, my hobby. And, uh, but eventually over time, I began to, um, um, I, I think, began to question how to connect my faith uh, to my work as an engineer. Um, I... I was sort of raised in reformed Christian circles. And so, you know, the notion that Jesus Christ is Lord of all was not strange to me, but 
specifically how you connect the dots uh, was something that uh, I had not been able to work out and had not uh, had an opportunity to learn. And, you know, you could say I had a, a personal faith at that point, but a very underdeveloped public theology, you know, about understanding about the implications of faith for, for work and vocation. And uh, at some point um, after working, yeah, almost about nine years in industry, I began to feel a tug towards teaching. And my wife and I prayed and discerned after a time that, that that's what I needed to pursue. And so I went back to school uh, and, uh, and got, did my graduate work. And from there, went on to teach in, uh, in a small Christian college in Canada, a place called Redeemer College, and uh, taught there for a number of years in the computer science department. Um, they didn't have engineering. And so I, uh, I, I, I began in that context in a Christian college to learn and develop as a Christian scholar, uh, understanding how to connect the dots. In fact, I was paid to connect the dots between faith and technology, which was something I, I delighted in. And I had lots of mentors and I was able to hang out with, you know, theologians and Christian philosophers and social scientists. And I, I, I learned a lot of things that my engineering undergraduate education did not teach me um, and learned how to gradually connect the dots. And, and through the course of time, I ended up um, at Calvin University, where I am currently. And, uh, and, and, and again, I continue to develop as a Christian scholar there. And, and this book uh, is the, uh, that you mentioned is, is the result of uh, uh, several years of collaborations with, with two other uh, engineers um, trying to articulate, you know, how to connect the dots between faith and engineering. Um, and, and it's a way to serve our students uh, in particular, but also practicing engineers who are, who are thinking about those sorts of things. You know, I... <clears throat> so one of the reasons we're doing this topic, you know, number one, you know, we live in a town where Rochester Institute of Technology, you know, engineering's huge in Rochester. Um, Aaron and I were in a small group. Um, I think probably <clears throat> half the people in there, or at least two or three studied some type of engineering. And, um, you know, Aaron's way more analytical. You can actually go look at his blog. He's got some good communication stuff. But, you know, I'm kind of the liberal arts guy. I'm kind of, I stick out like a sore thumb. So help us non-engineers understand, like, what what are the challenges of integrating faith with engineering? I can take a guess that, you know, you live in this world that's very, you know, in some ways creative, in other ways that's very... Um, orderly at a chaos and then you have this faith that can seem very feelings and stuff talk to us about the challenges that engineers faith with integrating faith with their careers yeah you know the especially if you're in high tech and you're working with technology um it's 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 difficult to think about how you know an ancient text like the bible might be able to speak to us right you can you can consult a bible dictionary and look for the word technology or computer or whatever and you're not going to find much. So I, I, I think, you know, the integration is not trivial uh, when it comes to those sorts of subjects. Many engineers are also trained in secular schools, as I was, where the education typically is very um, rigorous and focused. You know, a lot of engineers end up taking, you know, uh, virtually all technical courses or uh, prerequisites for technical courses and um and maybe only a small handful of of uh of arts and humanities uh, liberal arts courses um and and so um their their education is, is very focused and it, it it's it's very one-sided and so they're not really equipped in their education either to be thinking about these things now i should put in a qualifier if you attend a christian liberal arts college and study engineering there a place like cedarville or Calvin University or many others, um, you will, as part of your education, uh, be given a bit of a broader education in addition to your engineering skills to think more um, deeply about the implications of your chosen profession and how your faith speaks to that. Um, but 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 it is it is it is an issue. Um, and in fact, that was my challenge, as I mentioned, sitting in a cubicle farm, thinking. Um, yeah, how do I connect the dots uh, between my work here and to my personal faith? Um, you know, if faith really is comprehensive, if it really is all of life uh, that that is impacted by my faith, then I need to think practically about, you know, what, what that looks like. 
Um, you know, there's this notion of quorum Deo, you know, we live every day before the face of God and everything that we do, um, uh, you know, the, the scriptures say, whether you eat or whether you drink, you know, do everything to the glory of God. And that it's this comprehensive faith that, that in all that we do, we respond to God in either obedience or, 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 uh, or disobedience. I think there's there's other challenges as to uh, that that engineers face. You know, oftentimes engineers are working for companies whose values differ from their own. And so finding ways to be faithful in, in, in that sort of context. Uh, navigating what it means to be a faithful presence. You know, um, for some of my students, I um, I say to them, you're going to be like a Daniel in Babylon. You're going to have to learn how to influence and to hold on to your faith and your practices in a place that might even be hostile uh, to your faith. I think engineers have other challenges too, that the whole notion of work-life balance can be difficult, um, although your, your mileage may vary depending on where you work. I worked in places that that were quite demanding and uh, and learning how to uh, balance those sorts of things is something that they don't teach you in school. In fact, engineering education is very unbalanced, right? It's a, it's a very rigorous program and, and leaves little time for extracurriculars often. And so, you know, as an engineer, learning to establish the habits and practices and spiritual disciplines that you need to kind of sustain yourself in that kind of context um, and then I think one other challenge that engineers face uh, because of their uh, sort of focused professional education is this temptation to apply engineering thinking to all of life, <laughs> you know, and, and my wife will readily point this out to me at times. But, um, you know, there's a kind of engineering mindset um, that you develop uh, in an engineering education. Right. And, and taken to an extreme it could develop into, you know, something called a technological worldview, right? Where you see everything, you know, everything in created reality as, as a technological object that can be manipulated and optimized, right? Uh, you reduce all problems to technical problems. And, uh, and that can be very um, unhelpful. Uh, and, and I would say not a Christian way of looking at a, a world that is diverse and in which all things hold together in Christ and for which all things are not technological objects to be manipulated. Um, and, and as I mentioned, my wife has has actually helped me with that. She's a fine arts major, and so we we were a good balance for each other. Um, and you know, she's uh, she's helped me to see that not everything in life is amenable to a technological fix. So um, so th those are all things that engineers struggle with. Now, now mind you, the the kind of thinking that engineering develops uh, in, in in an engineering education is very helpful for providing useful goods and services for people and solving practical problems. Uh, there are ways to show love for neighbor and and to uh, to do other useful things with that kind of thinking, but, but sort of understanding its context and how it also relates to to, to faith are the are, are the things that can be a challenge when when one is working as an engineer. You know, I want to go one step deeper because you're having these conversations mm -hmm. with students, and yes. you know, a few a few weeks ago we had uh, Jay Kim who wrote Analog Church and analog Christian. And, you know, I, I guess if, if I could be in a classroom at Calvin university is, is the fear I'm going to create something that's actually going to hurt the next generation, like an app, like a Facebook or well, like a Facebook, I, I sound like I'm 85 there, but anyway, like, like is, <laughs> you know, I want to create something to make the world a better place but I have no yeah. idea what the implications are. Is that kind of the moral, I wouldn't say ambiguity, but kind of what you're wrestling with your students or what does that look like in the classroom to prepare them? And maybe even just a corollary to that too is, uh, is I'm, I mean, curious, I think it connects to that. Is there a wrestling with the idea of, is, is technology and engineering, is it value neutral? Like, that, is that something that your yes. students have to wrestle with? So I think that kind of ties together. Yeah, that's why I mentioned it. I love that. Yes. In fact, I was going to begin with that notion, right? If, if you, um, and that's an important one that we start with very early on, um, is introducing our students to the notion that technology is value laden, that it is not neutral. Um, of course, if, if you think that technology is completely neutral, then uh, you can argue that the developers have no responsibility, right? It's all up to the users to kind of use it in, in, in a responsible way. And because the technology itself embeds no values, 
um, that 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 the that the designer is sort of freed of any responsibility. And I think increasingly more and more it's easier to convince students that that's not the case. Although you know some remain skeptical. Uh, but you know there's documentaries like the social dilemma on on Netflix that you know many of our students have seen and and other sort of uh, developments, especially in social networking and other um, modern you know digital technologies and smartphone smartphone platforms and whatnot that people are readily realizing now even in their own lives that these things are changing things right they're changing the way we think they're changing the way we relate they're changing politics they're changing the way that we um, that we work. So, so these things have profound impacts on us um, and, and on our society and on our neighbors. And, uh, and engineers who are involved in, in working in those areas have a, have a responsibility to think about how these tools are shaping um, the, their users and, and beyond that. And so we begin with that premise. And, and once you accept the premise that, yeah, you know, when you, define, when you develop an artifact, it's not just a technological widget, uh, it's a cultural artifact that, that impacts um, people in many different ways and that we have a responsibility, then the question is, well, how do we love our neighbor, all right? The, 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 the end user, how does an engineer love their neighbor who is the user of their products? And so um, throughout our education uh, at Calvin, um, we introduce a series of design norms, we call them. It comes out of um, the scriptures, but also Christian philosophy, um, ways and aspects of of reality that engineers need to keep in mind when they're when they're developing products you know um, some of them are basic biblical uh, aspects things like justice you know and ensuring that our, our products don't uh, unjustly impact a certain populations thinking about giving people their due you know there's norms that that uh, impact how we relate social norms there's the norm of cultural appropriateness. So we, we, we have a whole bunch of these norms that we encourage our, our students to think about. And in fact, in our senior project in computer science and engineering at Calvin, we require that the students not only, you know, when, when they present their senior projects, not only give the technical kind of details of how they solve the particular practical problem, but we require them to go through a series of design norms and think about, you know, how is this product that thought through in terms of its impact socially, environmentally, um, you know, justice wise, you know, in terms of cultural appropriateness, you know, all, all of these other sorts of factors. And, and to be frank with you, um, um, th this is why, um, and Peter mentioned this, you know, a, a Christian liberal arts um, education is important for engineers. If you're creating a cultural artifact when you're designing technology, then you should be aware of some social sciences. You should be aware of uh, some Christian philosophy. You should be aware of um, historical factors. I mean, all, all of these things help inform a designer who's building a cultural artifact to be able to do so more thoughtfully and, and how do, uh, more I'm responsibly. curious just to follow up on that. How, how um, I think I saw in your book, I don't remember if it was a chapter that you wrote or one of your colleagues, but um, quickly noticed that, you know, there was a conversation about um, design and um, how there can be, you know, you could be designing a, a good thing like a Noah's Ark, or you could be designing something like a Tower of Babel. Um, you know, what, uh, if you, if, if there are students who, or young engineers um, who find themselves in a situation where they're they're wondering about if they are creating a cultural artifact, they are creating the Tower of Babel, what do they do? Or, or how do they get themselves into a project where they're creating more of an art type <laughs> of project? Yeah, no, I, I think those are, those are good questions to ask yourself. One of the challenges um, I think a lot of engineers have is they don't always necessarily often, actually, they don't decide uh, what's being designed. It's, you know, it's usually in the context of a corporation um, or some other entity or a customer that's, that's providing certain specifications. And so an engineer has to work often within certain constraints. Um, and, um, and so thinking about how an engineer within their sphere of influence um, can, can, can nudge a design in a more just and, uh, and normative direction, I think, is an important part of, of the role of an engineer. Um, I think, in, you know, in certain, you know, rare cases, engineers may even want to outright refuse to work in certain contexts where they are building a Tower of Babel, for instance, or, or something like that, where, where, where their work or the motivations behind it or the, uh, 
uh, the goal is something that would be antithetical to, uh, to, to what a Christian ought to be uh, pouring themselves into. Uh, but ma many other cases, you know, um, you know, companies are providing goods and services. And so a, a faithful engineer in those sorts of contexts will be thinking about in, 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 in my opportunity to influence the design as I sit around the table, as I interact with my you know, teammates, uh, my, uh, my project manager and others and the customer, how can I be a faithful presence in this context? And, and, and how can I bring some of these design norms that uh, we touched on earlier? How can we bring those into play in the, the, these particular circumstances? And, uh, and so I think uh, it, it's quite a complex, you know, situation where, you know, engineers have a whole variety of different things that they have to uh, take into consideration. Derek, I, I kind of want to move us a little off topic. So <clears throat> Aaron and I have a close friend. His name's Sherwin. He's an engineer. And one of his quotes to me is this. He goes, Peter, there's two types of engineers. There's engineers that love doing the same thing every day, creating order. And then there's engineers that give them a blank canvas and a blank room and give them a problem and give them five days to solve it. That one's a little bit more technical, the other one's a little bit more creative. You know, just even for our non-engineer friends, it is that, a, not that I'm saying Sherwin wouldn't be accurate, is that kind <laughs> of how you experience things or, you know, what's your perspective on the different types of engineers? Yeah, no, that, that that's a good question. I mean, th there's already various different technical areas under engineering, civil, chemical, mechanical, electrical, systems design, software, and so on. So, so that there's various different areas that people operate. Usually engineers are working in part of a larger team. They're not just, you know, um, individual kind of individuals working on their own in a garage, although there is, there is that stereotype too. Um, and, uh, and, and I would say that most engineers, even ones, um, um, working in, in many of them working in industry are working with a set of design specifications that have come from a customer or from the, the corporation. Um, in, at least in my experience, I never got to sit in a cubicle with, with a blank canvas and just design something. It was always, you know, um, something that had a lot of constraints, you know, in terms of cost, in terms of features and these sorts of things. But that's not to say that isn't a creative activity, right? If, if you're creating something that has a lot of constraints, a lot of specifications, a lot of requirements, there could be a substantial amount of creativity required to meet all of these things. Oftentimes constraints are competing, right? So if you're, if you're trying to increase features, but reduce cost, you're trying to, you know, in, in, in increase sort of stewardship or sustainability constraints while also reducing cost. All, all of these things are intention. And, uh, and, and, and that's why, you know, we, we as engineers don't just engineer things, we design things, right? It's, it's this creative process. So I would say even the engineer that's often um, doing things that are similar is still exercising a, a degree of creativity. Um, um, but the one thing I really liked, uh, I worked in small high-tech companies. Um, and as a student, I worked as a co-op student in larger companies. I liked the smaller company because... Um, it wasn't so much that I had a blank canvas, but I was wearing more hats, right? You know, at one point I'd, I'd be working in manufacturing and then I'd have to pivot over into the design uh, group and sometimes I'd have to go and visit customers. So I, I found that really um, exhilarating being part of a smaller company where there was a lot of different roles that I could take on. But, but at each of them, there was opportunities for, um, for exercising creativity. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, so I, 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 I wanted to ask the question following up on that was, you know, um, where do you when you're trying to encourage your uh, engineering students or young engineers or people you're working with about um, when they're trying to connect the dots between their faith and the engineering career? You know, I'm sure that there's probably a host of places you can point to where, you know, you can see God is a God is an engineer. He's a great creative God and he makes all these things work. Um, but I think I wanted to connect that actually to another question I, I had for you. Maybe you can just answer it all at once if you want to. But uh, mm -hmm. so that's that will get to where engineers are trying to connect their faith to the work that they've been trained to do. Um, I'm also curious the other way is are there things that you find 
engineering students, young engineers or engineers who have been doing engineering for a long time, what are they frustrated with with the church? Um, I'm not trying to look at Peter as in like, what well, are they frustrated with pastors, but like, what are they frustrated with, with the church? And, you know, is, is there a, is there, are there certain themes that come up often? Yeah. <laughs> there are tons of engineers that are frustrated. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, yeah, that, 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 that's an interesting question. Um, to, to be honest, in my own experience, I haven't, I, I haven't encountered a lot of engineers that are frustrated with the church uh, in any way that would be uh, p- particular to being an engineer. Um, I think there are, I mean, occasionally, you know, in, in, in engineers sort of, you know, are, are people who, who love, you know, they're technophiles in a sense, they love technology and they love sort of the newest gadgets and whatnot. And, and so there are people, our engineers, um, who probably would like to see the church embrace all the latest high tech developments, you know, um, to, to, to pick one, um, um, really, um, uh, new, new, new sort of development, you know, something like, uh, you know, virtual reality church in the metaverse or something like that, right? Seeing VR and then going, oh, we got to put our church in the metaverse. Um, and, uh, but I think a lot of engineers, uh, many of them are actually quite thoughtful uh, and, and sort of, if you recognize that technology is value laden, uh, that it's not neutral, as we mentioned earlier, then introducing technology in the church changes the church, right? It, it, it biases the church in certain ways. And it's, it's not just a neutral tool that can be inserted into a church service. So I, I actually bring this up with my students, you know, do you think, um, um, you know, what sort of technologies are appropriate for, for, for the, for the worship service, right? What about smoke machines, right? And uh, concert lights, you know, like these sorts of things come with, Certain biases, they, 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 um, they, even the microphone, right, and and and, and the praise team um, can uh, c- can liken a church service to a concert um, where the congregation becomes passive onlookers to a performance, and and that that's not what worship or singing is supposed to be about, right? It's a, the whole purpose of a praise team is to is to help people sing better. Help the congregation. So, so technology changes things, even things like microphones and, and lights and, and these sorts of things. Um, um, and so understanding technology, I think, and many engineers, I think, have an appreciation of that, um, that, that, that technology changes things and that we need to be careful about which kinds of technologies we select uh, for use in church or for evangelism for that matter. Um, and uh, I think one of the things... That, that, that the church can really be helpful and maybe where the church can, can help us all uh, think more, more carefully about the habits and the rituals uh, that our personal electronic devices bring into our lives. You know, the smartphone is an incredibly intimate device that comes preloaded with a whole way of looking at the world. It, it's certainly not value neutral. And of course, you know, um, I think a lot of, um, uh, uh, recent writing um, uh, has been pointing us to the fact that these habits and rituals are changing us uh, in certain ways. You know, the ways that um, some of our uh, personal devices are changed the way that we think and the way that we relate. I have a colleague at Kelvin University uh, named Jamie Smith. He's a philosopher. He's written a lot about um, uh, how habits and rituals impact our heart, right? And, 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 uh, um, that we become what we love uh, is, is the title of one of his books. And I think the church can be really, really helpful in helping not only engineers, but all of us who are immersed in a technological age to think more, uh, more judiciously about how we adapt and use digital devices in our own lives. Um, I think, you know, going back to the notion of VR church and, and, and actually having been through a pandemic where, where we've had to meet online for at least for a time, um, thinking about the importance of what it means to be an embodied incarnational community, right? Um, and, and thinking about what that looks like. Um, we went through a period at, at Calvin, as, as did other schools, you know, where we had online teaching for a time during the pandemic. And it's, the, it's there's no substitute for, for in-person classes. And you can ask any student um, uh, about that as well, or any professor for that matter. Um, so, so I think the church can, can really be helpful 
um, and 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 um, and helping encourage engineers, but also just congregants in general, to think carefully about um, um, how they adopt technology into their own life and about their own personal spiritual disciplines and practices. I think what I hear you saying as we kind of come back to this question, why does Jesus influence my engineering career? There's certain questions that engineers are like specifically designed to answer. And in some ways, Christianity is designed to answer another set of questions. But if you don't have maybe the moral or um, even the image of God questions answered, you know, you're, you might be leaving a lot on the table to your engineering career. That it's probably maybe a gross overstatement, but I, I think that that's kind of what I'm hearing from you is that, would that be the way you'd put it? Yeah. I, I think fundamental questions about what it means to be human, about who we are, about who God is, um, are fundamental, um, pre sort of presuppositions and, 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 uh, preceding questions that we need to have some kind of answer for, before we can think about, you know, what ought we to do our engineering for? What ought we to direct technology towards? Um, what, what is the, what does it mean to be a human being fully alive, right? And I think Christianity has some really good answers for thinking about that. Um, and, and, and those sorts of things can inform the kinds of tools that, 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 we, that, that we seek to develop. Yeah. Um, so w w as people are trying to, you know, uh, they're seeking to, to develop uh, good tools, value um, positive tools. Um, mm. You know, I think that's a that's definitely a, a, a worthy endeavor. And I'm sure I think it's good that people are, are wrestling with that. I, I am curious, too. You, you mentioned that a lot of times engineers are not working in a place. They're not working with a blank canvas where they have no constraints or, or constraints set by themselves. Even a lot of times it's in the mm -hmm. context of a bigger company or, um, or even a smaller company, there's still constraints put on you. You know, I, I noticed in the, in the, n near the end of your book, you had a number of, um, you know, fictional letters going back and forth to a, a, a fictional young student, uh, it's, it's who had just been got maybe out of college for five years or something like that. And had been, had gone gone into the workplace with um high hopes and you know super excited mm -hmm. about getting to be part of a project and then it and then it seemed like uh maybe uh this student was there were a number of things that you were expressing through these letters that, that the student might be wrestling with one of them just really seemed like they kind of felt like a dilbert in from the dilbert comic strip you know like they <laughs> had yeah. these it wasn't just artificial constraints it was things that didn't make sense and were stifling the, that creativity I'm I'm curious, you know, what you were trying to communicate through those fictional letters that you put in the back of the book, which I think is very clever. I love that, by the way. Um, but also, yeah, the, yeah. But where, the, what what are you hoping that people would take away from that and um, how to get their their creativity back? Yeah, no. The last chapter, yeah, is titled "Letters to a Young Engineer," and so as you describe, it's these series of letters that are exchanged between a, um, a relatively new, young, recent graduate engineering um, student. Who, who finds himself in industry working for the Acme Corporation. And, uh, and he's writing letters back to his Christian college professor, uh, Dr. Ben Weiss, um, and uh, basically sharing some of his you know, frustrations of now being in the real world and some of the challenges that he faces and, and you know, some of the difficulty, some of the challenges of connecting the dots um, between his faith and, and, and his work. And... Um, um, and, and, and it also comes up with a variety of, you know, the, the, the student writes um, about a few p uh, particular uh, challenges that he faces um, and, and how he ought to respond uh, in the workplace. And, and I think we wanted to end with this partly because it's a kind of encouragement for people who are working in those contexts. The, the, the way that Professor Van Weiss writes to this former student is one of encouragement he, uh, he blesses and encourages him through his words. You know, it, it's kind of a model of a, of a mentoring relationship that we can all benefit from. You know, it sort of tries to model that. But it also tries to avoid, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, temptation sometimes to resort to platitudes or prescriptive sort of solutions for things. But sort of showing how using Christian 
um, thinking and, and through prayer and through mutual encouragement, you can, you can, you can sort of wrestle with things and, and find a way forward um, uh, that's faithful and responsible. It, it, it shows that, you know, things aren't always um, trivial or straightforward in the rough and tumble um, of the real world, right, where the rubber hits the road. Um, and, so, and so these letters were meant as a way of kind of engaging uh, those sort of real world topics. Uh, but in a way that was, you know, encouraging and and uh, and sweet. In fact, I, I, I if, if I'm honest, the, the, those letters are actually um, kind of letters between my older self and my younger self, right? It's sort of I'm now um, what's a good way to put it? Upper middle aged, let's say, uh, you know, as a professor, and and writing these letters to. Um, you know, my younger self, the, 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 the fellow I talked about earlier, who was sitting in a cubicle for, farm, kind of wondering, how do I, how do I apply my faith to my work as an engineer? And so, um, and so my, my hope is that those letters will also be encouraging for others who find themselves in those positions. And, um, um, and then also kind of encouraging people to think about finding mentors in their own life. And so, and so I hope, I hope those final chapters are, are helpful for those reasons. You know, I might get a little controversial here. So you're a professor and, you know, you're probably good at putting students in their place. So, um, so, so I listened to the latest of this recording, the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast. And it was with Tim Keller and he was talking about pastors and it was kind of sobering. He made this comment about how we th in the West think that our vocation our career and our job need to match with our passion. And he went as extreme to say, we've made an idol out of that. I think, you know, maybe a, a mm. more diplomatic way to say that is, you know, we've put so much pressure on our career and calling. And, you know, I, when I heard that, I was thinking about this interview and I've been kind of reflecting. And even now that we're, you know, at the letter part that we talked about in your book, but. You know, with engineers, I find it, um, I rarely find an engineer that has a hard time getting a job. Um, I guess I'd like to hear you kind of respond to, like, what's it like for an engineer to maybe put too much pressure on their career or even say my passion needs to be like, an, you know, it's almost an idol of my career, my job, all of this needs to fit together like, are we dumbing down our expectations by saying, hey, I'm going to stick in a job for 20 years. I'm doing relatively good work. It's not, you know, damaging society, but, you know, I could, this is what I really want to do. Have we put so much emphasis on career and passion that we miss out on the normal and ordinary, or would you push someone forward? How would you process through something like that? No, I, I think that, that that's an important point to make, um, and this this comes up uh, in conversations about vocation um, in 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 the classroom as well. I mean, part of the notion of you know um, putting all these apples in the vocational basket, you know, um, about how this is how our, this is our meaning in life, this is where we find um, our, our our service in life. Uh, can elevate uh, vocation and career probably to a level that uh, that it ought not to be. So I, I think you're right. I think you could make an idol out of, in fact, you can make an idol out of any good thing, um, right? If it takes on ultimate value. Um, and, and in some senses, this whole conversation is one of privilege. I mean, there's places where um, other parts of the world where people actually don't have much of a choice about what they're going to do, right? They're s subsistence farmers and they, they have to do certain things in order to just keep themselves and their families um, eating and alive. And the notion of choosing a vocation or a career would be, would, would be, um, um, you know, um, very remote. So, so I think, I, I think to, to start off by saying that is not inappropriate. I think students, um, also uh, have to realize that their first calling, their first vocation is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and that everything else sort of flows out of that, that primary sort of uh, calling to be a disciple. And, that, and that, that calling is much bigger than our paid career or vocation. It, it includes, you know, our, um, our, uh, our 
relationships with family and in our community and in our churches. These are all places where we have callings as well and where we need to exercise um, our, our Christian vocations. So, so sort of expanding the notion of vocation beyond just, just the career. And yeah, I've even encountered, you know, at, at the different schools I've taught at, you know, um, I, I would say somewhat sad cases where people are drawn to engineering or computer science strictly because of um, a desire to get a good job, but they, they really don't have the passion. Sometimes they don't have the abilities. Um, and so that, that, that ends up in difficult uh, conversations. Uh, sometimes there's parental expectations that really nudge students into directions where, um, you know, where, where they will not flourish. Um, and so that those are sometimes sad, difficult conversations. So, so I think, yeah, the, everything needs to be rightly ordered when you're thinking about vocation and career. And I think if you start with our primary vocation as being a disciple of Jesus Christ and then having things flow out of that will be a way of avoiding, um, you know, the, the way of making it into an idol if we begin with, you know, our, our, our service to Jesus Christ. Um, I have students read from a book uh, called The Fabric of Faithfulness by Lee Hardy. It's an older book, but there's some really good chapters about discerning career and vocation um, that, that puts things, I think, into their proper place and order. And, uh, and our, uh, uh, it, it's created really interesting dialogues with my students. Um, but, but I think, again, uh, to, to, to state it most simply, to begin with, our vocation is being a disciple of Jesus and having everything flow out of that. And again, a Christian college, of course, will help you um, think about those things in ways that that, that a secular professional education uh, will not, where you, you'll need to develop that kind of thinking on your own. Can you Could you give us an example of um, even maybe some of the student projects that you've, um, you know, some of the technical projects you ask your students to do, uh, What's a way that you've seen the integration of of faith with the the engineering work that they're doing? How has that made a difference in in kind of the final design product that you've seen, even in a in a in a in a, in a assignment you've given them? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Now, you know, um, sometimes it can be quite mundane. You know, thinking about uh, a friendly and useful user interface you know, a, a helpful user experience, um, um, you know, thinking about um, energy usage, uh, thinking about um, uh, sustainability, um, you know, and taking those sort of factors into consideration during design. One, one of the projects that I've worked on with students, I've also done service projects. And so one of the projects um, uh, I've been involved in is working in majority world countries with my students, bringing uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Raspberry Pi, but it's a it's a computer about the size of a deck of cards that can run a full desktop operating system, runs on about three or four watts of power, and uh, runs a open source software. We've been bringing these into um, into majority world countries and in, in, in rural sort of sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, Central America, and places that are. Um, challenged by um, poverty and, uh, and access to, to digital platforms and help set these up in, in K-12 schools and working with, uh, working with local teachers, K-12 teachers, to help um, give students access to, um, to, to, to education on computers and, and access to digital resources. Um, I, that particular project is, is a I think a, a, a really uh, nifty example of how we can take some of these digital tools, finding appropriate technology for use in those sorts of contexts and helping other people to flourish. Um, so yeah, th those are just a few thoughts that come to mind. Wow, that's really powerful. Derek, the good news is uh, we always close with the same question. So um, what would Jesus have to say to this question? Why does uh, he influence our engineering career? So like a great professor, um, Aaron and I are going to answer this question and then you get to clean up whatever mess or heresy we leave. Does that sound good? <laughs> okay. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> you, you want me to go first? I mean, yeah, why don't you go first? Okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, from the very beginning, I was just so glad that we had this conversation and um, I, I, I think it's uh 
it's really important because sometimes when you're talking about technology, when you're talking about engineering or um, other aspects of technology, people don't necessarily think about um, the the values behind it. That that you know there is an idea that oh maybe this is just all value neutral. It's how you use it, but that's I think that's an important thing that people need to to wrestle with. And um, I, I do I I I do think that uh, Jesus cares about how we create things and and. Uh, God is a great, he's a great engineer. He's a great creator. He's the one that uh, put all these things into play in our, in our world that we're discovering as we go. Um, and I also think, uh, you know, he, it also, it, I, I, I'm sure that it gets into, this gets into the book more too, but it, um, how people approach the engineering career. There's, there's the projects you work on and how you work on projects, but there's, a, there's also, I mean, I think this is broader than just engineering career. It's anyone's career, but how you how you actually do the work and how Jesus um, affects how you interact with the environment that you're in. So I I think that this is a, a great conversation, and I um, I hope others find it useful too. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, oh. Go, um, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you, can clean, uh, you can clean us both up at the same time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, you know, I'll just simply say this, uh, you know, Derek, I, I think what you're kind of reminding me of is there's more engineering in the Bible than we give it credit. You know, you walk through the Old Testament, God gives specific dimensions for the tabernacle and the temple. And I think sometimes people forget um, there's this great book by Alicia Britt Chloe called Anonymous, and it just reminds us that Jesus had 30 years of pretty much unrecorded work where he was a carpenter. And carpenters back then were actually they fixed you know the horse carts and other things like that so Jesus has some engineering in him and even Paul who wrote the majority of the New Testament was a tent maker which there's a lot of engineering to that and so I'm just kind of left with thinking why does Jesus influence my engineering career I just I'd respond with Jesus had engineering work and um, I just I, I think that you're at home with Jesus when you're doing engineering to love your neighbor. So that's what I throw in there. Yeah, no, the, the, I think those are those are excellent ways of of, of getting at that question. Um, chapter two in our book is a, a survey of technology and the biblical story, and sort of looks at the ways that technology appears in the biblical story and the the way that it can be directed towards building towers of Babel. Or building, you know, golden calves, or whether it can be directed towards, you know, building Noah's Ark or building the tabernacle, or being used in ways that that honor and glorify God and show love for neighbor. I think the question, you know, what does Jesus have to say about this topic, um, you know, can be taken in many different directions. But I think one helpful reference to think about that is Colossians one. It's, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. You know where. Uh, where we're told, you know, for in him, all things were created, right? All things visible and invisible, all things were created through him and for him. So we see that Jesus Christ is at the center of all creation and all the possibilities in creation. And technology is part of the latent potential in creation, right? Colossians 1, you know, underscores that all things were created for him. So so it's actually all about Jesus, right? Um, um, right? The... The, the notion that all things hang together in him. Um, there's this uh, former professor at Calvin um, who, uh, who once said, nothing matters but the kingdom, but because of the kingdom, everything matters. You know, this idea that, that, that because of Christ, all of these things matter, um, is, uh, as Aaron mentioned. And, um, and so I, I think that, you know, the uh, Colossians 1 kind of shows how Christ is supreme over all of these things, including including technology, um, that he's going to reconcile all things to himself. Uh, we also read in Colossians 1. So, so Christ's work on the cross, his redemption, is certainly about personal salvation, but, but it, it, it's a cosmic kind of salvation. Christ is, is going to restore and renew all things, right? And then in 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible goes on to tell us... Um, that you know we're called to be agents of reconciliation, right? So so we're we're called to kind of participate in this work. And engineering is one of these areas uh, that need reconciliation, right? Between people and the planet, between people and each other, between us and God, us and ourselves, 
um, and technology is is part of that that work of of restoration that uh, that needs to be done. And uh, and of course, if you look at the whole arc of the biblical story, it begins with a garden, uh, but it ends with a city. Right, a city implies sort of the garden plus cultural development, perhaps even technology in some way, shape, or form. Um, I speculate with my students that there'll even be computers in the new heavens and the new earth. You know, it's it's it's, a, it's speculative, I know, but I I think all of the creational possibilities will be there uh, without sin. So you know, it's hard to imagine what all of that might look like. But 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 I I see that trajectory in the biblical story of um, the garden plus the 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 unfolding uh, sort of you know in in a perfect world uh, in the new heaven and the new earth uh, at, at the end of time and of course in the meantime we're called to make some imperfect models of that perfect world to come uh, and uh, and to work in in this kingdom which Christ has inaugurated and so um, so yeah all things were made by him and through him they hold together they were made for him he's the telos the reason for everything. And that also needs to shape our, our engineering work. So, um, so yeah, those are just some other thoughts I might add to the things you've already mentioned. And uh, I think that gives our, our engineering and our technical work meaning and, um, and, um, and, and uh, knowing that God cares about these things. Derek, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we let everyone go, just remember that uh, two weeks after this airs, uh, you have the opportunity in that window of time to buy uh, his book, A Christian F Guide to Technology for Engineers and Designers at ivpress.com. Um, you can use the code YGOD and get a 30% discount. Derek, where else can people find you online? What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, I have a personal website at Kelvin. If you just... Um, grab your favorite web search engine and type my name in, you'll probably encounter it, but it's, it's something like sites.kelvin.edu slash Derek is, uh, is my personal webpage, Derek, D-E-R-E-K. Um, that would be a good place to um, find more of my writings. And, um, and yeah, if you want to reach out and contact me, there's information there about that. Awesome. Well, Derek, thanks for joining us. As always, you can find out more about us at whygodwhypodcast.com. Click the subscribe button. You'll get this episode and other great episodes like this. Thank you so much for joining us.